nowadays, about 75% of abortions take place in uh, the first 10 weeks of pregnancy. And that's when the, the procedure is safest, and it's most straightforward. However, in spite of that, uh, the right to abortion isn't secure, and it's never been secure. Um, over the past 40 years, there have been repeated attempts to uh, restrict the right. Uh, in the early years after 1967, there were attempts to recriminalise it, to repeal the Abortion Act. And most recently, as Ellie was saying, there was a serious attempt, a failed attempt, I'm happy to say, in Parliament to reduce the abortion time limit from where it currently stands at 24 weeks um, down to 22 or 20, 16 or even as low as 12 weeks. So every few years, this vocal and active minority of anti-choice activists and politicians, they start a new attempt to restrict our right to abortion. So today, what I'm going to focus on is the current push to limit access and why it's particularly difficult to counter and, and why I think that it's happening right now. So what we have at the moment is a convergence of factors that, in my opinion, make it a dangerous time for the pro-choice movement. Firstly, we've got parliamentary and political change. So in 2010, after the general election, 140 MPs, pro-choice MPs, either lost their seats or stood down from Parliament, including, as Ellie said, Dr. Evan Harris, one of our staunchest pro-choice advocates. So what we have now is a Conservative-led government, um, and although there are pro-choice supporters amongst Conservatives, um, historically the Conservative Party is less positive towards abortion rights than Labour and the Liberal Democrats have been. The new intake of Tory MPs, they're very young and they're very shiny, and they're also very socially conservative, and there's a lot of them. And David Cameron himself, we know he's spoken out in favour of restricting access and, and many of his Tory cabinet ministers agree with him. What we're also seeing is a willingness by the Department of Health to um, seriously engage with anti-choice groups and their ideas. Um, you might have seen earlier this year an anti-choice campaign group called LIFE, uh, which is opposed to abortion in all circumstances. They were invited to advise uh, the government on its new sexual health panel. So they will be helping to craft policy on abortion when they don't think it should be legal at all. We're also seeing the government keen to get voluntary and charitable and faith-based organisations more involved in delivering public services as part of its localism agenda. Now this is a big issue when it comes to sensitive areas. Um, I think <laughs> yesterday um, you heard about um, Eve's Housing losing its contract. Um, it's years of experience you know, providing specialist services for women in, in great difficulties, they've lost their contract to the Salvation Army. Um, but what you might not have heard about, also a couple of months ago, Richmond Council, a Tory-run council, it awarded a contract to provide confidential counselling to teenagers of things like unplanned pregnancy and contraception and sexuality and homophobic bullying. Um, they took that away from a secular local charity that had been doing that for 20 years very successfully. And they gave that contract to the Catholic Children's Society. Now, I'm sure that I know that the Catholic Children's Society does a great deal of good work, but I think most people would agree that um, engaging an organisation um, that is opposed to abortion, contraception, homosexuality, is entirely inappropriate to engage them in providing that kind of service. So that's the first thing, political change. We've also seen a change of approach and a change of language from anti-choice activists. So instead of taking a full frontal assault on abortion rights, uh, like we've seen in the past, like trying to outlaw it altogether or trying to reduce the time limit. What we're seeing is a series of smaller measures designed to chip away at the edges of reproductive rights and to change the climate around it and to change public opinion. And what we're seeing is these measures couched in extremely reasonable language, they're very media friendly and they appear very moderate. So the current campaign that I'm going to talk about um, in a minute led by Conservative MP Nadine Dorries, which I'm sure many of you will have heard of her. And um, Nadine Dorries says it's about empowering women. She's co-opting the language of our movement um, to, to further her own anti-choice agenda. She says that, in fact, she says she's not anti-choice. She's not pro-choice or pro-life. She is pro-woman. Um, and she did exactly the same thing with her abstinence-based sex education bill a few months ago. That was all about empowering girls. So what she's doing, she's reframing the debate around this spurious pro-woman agenda. And she's taking the right to say no to sex, the right to say no to abortion, and she's placing it alongside things like the sexualization of young girls, 
the prevalence of pornography, the prevalence of lads mags, and she's making it sound very reasonable, and I think she's striking a chord with the public, and she's striking a chord with many women as well. Especially the three, the three quarters of the population that say they support the right to abortion in some form. If you break that down, if you drill down into that, you know, a lot of those people are only in favour of it in cases of rape and incest, or they would be in favour of it in extremely limited circumstances. So there's a lot of movement there to, to gather support for an anti-choice cause, unfortunately. The third thing that's going on is the arrival of American Christian anti-choice groups in the UK. People like 40 Days for Life, Bound for Life, um, they are very wealthy American Christian groups, and they're setting up chap chapters in the UK. So we're seeing them protesting more frequently outside abortion clinics. Their methods are more militant than we've seen, are more extreme, and as I say, there's a lot of money sloshing around there. At the same time, we're seeing UK groups like Christian Concern for Our Nation and the Christian Legal Centre becoming more vocal about defending Christians against perceived discrimination against them. So I'm not trying to claim that the situation is anything like as bad as it is in, um, in America, in the mainland UK that is, um, where, as you know, abortion providers are murdered, clinic staff are in fear of their lives, uh, women are routinely harassed in uh, outside clinics across the country. But the fact is these groups are exporting their tactics to the UK and they are expanding their operations over here. And obviously that's, that's really concerning. And at this point, we should say, I should say that you know, we can't forget the fact that the situation in Northern Ireland has far more in common with the situation in America than the mainland UK. Um, if you try to go to the Family Planning Association's premises in Belfast, a really unpleasant anti-choice group called Precious Life are outside there all the time. And they are very aggressive and they're very unpleasant. And, um, and they're not going anywhere. And as many of you will know, women in Northern Ireland they have virtually no access to abortion. The, the Abortion Act was never extended to Northern Ireland. So if a woman in, from Northern Ireland needs an abortion, she has to travel to the mainland UK, or she has to go abroad, and if she comes here, she can't use the NHS. She has to pay for the procedure herself. So, and obviously it's placing an extreme financial and emotional burden on women who are currently British taxpayers and British citizens. And every year, about 1,700 women have to make that journey. And the responsibility for that climate in Northern Ireland is largely because of it, it being a more devout, a more, a more religious environment than the rest of the UK. Regardless of, of whether you're Protestant or Catholic, this is the issue that unites both sides of the sectarian divide. None of them want any, more, any access to abortion in, in Northern Ireland. So I want to be really clear that, that we need to support Irish women and that we're trying to support Irish women in their struggle for rights and that we need to be vigilant about religiously inspired anti-choice um, activity coming to the rest of the UK. So, we're seeing this alarming convergence of factors. Um, and right now, that's playing out in attempts to introduce new pre-abortion counselling arrangements. This is the Right to Know campaign that I, I just mentioned. So, very briefly, Nadine Dorries and Frank Field, Nadine Dorries, Conservative backbencher, Frank Field, former Labour minister. They've tabled amendments to the Health and Social Care Bill. And that's the, the main piece of government legislation about reforming the NHS. Uh, and their amendments would require GPs to provide a new layer of um, counselling for women seeking abortion. It's called independent advice and counselling. Uh, women wouldn't be required to accept it, but GPs would be required to make sure that it was offered. Now, again, that sounds reasonable. It's not going to be mandatory. Why would we reject, you know, object to more advice on the subject? Well... I really want to, to make sure everyone knows that it's not reasonable and it's, it's actually designed to restrict and delay abortion access um, and it's, a it's an attempt to chip away at our rights. Um, and I'm just going to briefly go through some of the problems associated with it. Firstly, it would strip abortion providers of the right to provide abortion counselling, which they do at the moment. Now, Nadine Dorries and co. claim that abortion providers have a vested interest in withholding information um, from women about the dangers of abortion. Um, about the physical and health, mental possible side effects because they're making money out of providing the procedure. And obviously this is, this is wrong on so many levels. Uh, firstly, major abortion providers in the UK, like BPAS and Mary Stopes, uh, they're charities, so they're, they're not for profit organisations. So they're, they're not doing this for the cash. Um, next, uh, private for profit um, healthcare providers are already treating and advising patients in all aspects of their healthcare 
under contract to the NHS, and um, the government is very keen for that to expand. Uh, we don't suspect the, the motives of other healthcare providers. We don't think that they're encouraging heart surgery for profit, for example. We trust their clinical judgment. Next, there is not a shred of evidence that BPAS or MSI, Mary Stokes, or anyone else have ever withheld information or attempted to persuade women to have an abortion or done anything other than follow clinical guidelines, which they're obliged to do. Now, yeah, as I'm saying, these, these providers, they're fully licensed by the Department of Health, they're very heavily regulated, uh, they follow guidelines, and what's more, about 20% of the women who um, go to BPAS to inquire about abortion, um, they decide not to go ahead with the procedure after they've received counselling from BPAS, uh, which, is a, which is a reasonable testimony to their impartiality. The other main problem with the proposals, though, is that if you take responsibility for providing this counselling away from abortion clinics, who is going to fill that gap? Um, and what really, we're really worried about is that the answer is that only organisations that are in a position to provide counselling on that scale are likely to be the big anti-choice organisations like LIFE, I've already mentioned, opposed to abortion in all circumstances, Care Confidential, huge Christian organisation. Now, these groups already have networks of crisis pregnancy centres around the country, and they're waiting in the wings to do the job on the NHS as well. Now, these organisations, they're not licensed, they're not regulated the way abortion providers are, they're not obliged to follow clinical guidelines or give medically accurate information. And, in fact, they have a tra track record of providing misleading and inaccurate and judgmental advice. Um, so they claim things like abortion will leave you infertile, it will give you breast cancer, you will be mentally scarred for life. Uh, they make really unpleasant claims. Um, I think a lot of people agree that it's absolutely unthinkable that this kind of organisation would be formally commissioned and given public money to uh, counsel women with unplanned pregnancies. It's bad enough that they're allowed to operate at all, but to take counselling away from regulated, trained abortion providers and give it to Christian anti-choice groups is an absolute travesty. But that's what these proposals are suggesting, and that's what the Department of Health is currently seriously considering. Now, there's, an actual, there's a chance that these um, proposals will be, will be uh, heard in Parliament on the 6th or 7th of September. Uh, they probably won't be, but they might be. And even if they're not debated, it looks like the Department of Health uh, wants to implement them anyway, uh, without a new law. So we're trying to make the public and politicians aware of what's going on and to tell them it's not reasonable or moderate and that this is an attack on choice uh, and, and the right to impartial information. It's really good now that the NHS pays for about 94% of all the abortions that take place in the UK. And that's really important when it's, it's a, a service that costs between 500 and 1500 pounds. We can't take our reproductive rights for granted. Uh, there are so many other things that need to be done, positive changes that need to be made, a global situation I haven't even had a chance to talk about. Um, but we really need your support on this issue. We, we need you to raise awareness of the issue and to make it a central part of your feminist campaigning. Abortion Rights is a small organisation, limited capacity, I'm afraid. Uh, we'd love it if you would join us. It's only cost five pounds if you're a student. But, in fact, it's more important that you spread the word and that you take forward campaigning um, yourselves in whatever way you think is most appropriate. And we'll help you in whatever way we can. And absolutely, finally, I just want to say that one in three women will have to have an abortion at some point in her life. And that everyone, everyone here will know someone, their, their sister or their friends or their mother or their aunts, um, that will have had one and will have needed to have one. And that's a lot of people and it's a very powerful constituency. And if we were all willing to stand up for our reproductive rights, it would be impossible to ignore us. Thank you very much.